Hello, and welcome to The Kosh. I'm your host, Timber Smith, and The Kosh is a podcast that spotlights people who've had an association with The Kosh and the surrounding Fox Cities area. Also, this episode of The Kosh is sponsored by Sturgeon Spirits Craft Distillery, The Kosh's newest tradition. Hey, Kosh listeners, how are you doing this morning? Once again, it is a beautiful weekend morning here in the Kosh. The sun is out, which always makes me happy. That always makes for better energy in the space. But I'm not going to lie. It is crispy, crisp cold. I was I was very disappointed with how cold it was. And um, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to listen to the episode with Orson, but Orson episode talks about, you know, where he comes from, which is the Caribbean. You know, when it's sunny, it's hot. And when it's cloudy, it's wet. Well, when it's sunny here, we don't know what it might be because it might be might be kind of warm or it might be freezing cold. It is a trick. That is what it is. And sometimes it's not a treat. So (laughs) that's what I'm going to say about that. All right. You know what, Kosh listeners, we're not going to take too long on the things. Uh, This morning, we're going to jump in because I think we got a very fire episode ahead of us. We have, well, you know what I say. You know what I'm going to say. I don't know why I continue to get these amazing, amazing guests. And of course, this week is no different. So without further ado... This week's guest is Agnes Footman Payne. Hello, Agnes. How are you doing this morning? I am fine. And how are you doing, Timber? I am doing excellent. I am excited to sit down with you. As a matter of fact, before we even turn, we pressed the record button. Me and Agnes was chopping it up, and I could tell if I didn't if I didn't press this record button, we might have been here some time. <laughs> but. You know, that's that's the way it goes here on the Kosh. And Agnes, you know, I'm just going to put you out there for a second. Yeah. Agnes walked here today. I sure did. And and look, she better than me. <laughs> <laughs> he better than me. Well, I walked here because I love walking. Huh? I love riding my bike. I love outside, regardless how cold it is. It's just a part of me. It's just something that is really a part of me. It needs to become more of a part of me because I need to do more walking. I, I do a little too much desk time here in my in my world. All right. Agnes, you ready to jump in? I sure am. Okay. Right. Can you please share a little something about yourself and your connection to the Kosh and the surrounding Fox Cities uh, region? Okay. First of all, I was born to military family. My family was in the Navy. We traveled all over. So we had great, great experience as a military child. I really did. And then my father, he retired to Florida. When he retired to Florida, which was Merritt Island, Florida, which is NASA is there, of course, and Cape Canaveral and all of that was there. It was a beautiful experience for for my siblings and I because we never saw chickens, <laughs> hogs. Bruh. What? Yeah. We you know, but living on the military bases. You never saw no chickens or no uh, hogs. No chickens and no hogs and no farming. So moving to Merritt Island, Florida was a beautiful experience for us, really. It was really a great, great experience for us. Okay. And then my father, you know, he, after we settled there, then my father was sort of like, okay, this is where we will be living for the time being, and and then we end up moving to Miami, Florida. Mm. What an experience! Oh well, I don't, look. Was Miami? Did Miami still? Was Miami as exciting then as now? Well, first of all, Miami. When we moved there, it was segregated. Florida was segregated at that time, so it was wonderful. We had our own black banks and clubs and. Your black doctors, you know, it was just the whole blackness was there because it was segregated. So it was different. It was different. Do I miss that in a way? Because we had everything, our black bands and, oh, events and everything was black. Everything was in one area Mm. in Miami at that time. When we moved there, it was fantastic. And then we went to 
segregated schools, mm. Booker T. Washington. I graduated from there in 1965, so that tells you my age. And so anyway, <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, and it was a beautiful experience being in an all-black school, black teachers. Boy, did we learn. They prepared us for a lot. I, I could see that. Now, I, I can't say that I had the same experience, but I, I think I could understand the value of it by far. Yes. Having your own black teachers and they going through the segregation themselves, they really were preparing you for, for the, the world. world. Mm-hmm. They were preparing you for the world and for the changes that was about to take place. Bruh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, with this, you know, the Martin Luther King, the Civil Rights Movement. So they really were preparing you for everything, really. And, you know, I can't say enough for what they, what they did. And I don't think I would be the person that I am today if it wasn't for the black teachers that I had. I can't stress that enough. Identity, having identity, uh, having representation to give you identity. It is so hard to dream to become something that you don't get the opportunity to see representation of. Yes. And Timber, I think that that's our problem today. You know, when you don't know where you came from, you don't know anything truly about the how the journey, the travel of what blacks have gone through. It sort of takes you away from who you really are. And then you grab, you try to get to another identity, which is not really you. Mm. It's not really you. Okay. So Miami, where do we go from there? Okay. Because I'm trying, I wait, we got to get to, um, we, we got a long way before Miami to, to the cash. Okay. Well, before Miami, we were living in, oh my God, all the military naval bases. Annapolis, Maryland was really my fun. I loved Annapolis, Maryland because we were living then the Naval Academy. We were living on the base with the Naval Academy. I remember we were all, you know, there was no black and white issues there on the base. Then we will know that we were separated when the duty boat would pick us up in the morning, take us across the bay to go to school. And there would be two buses waiting for us, one for the white kids and one for the black kids. Mm. Yeah. You know what's, you know, it's powerful just about what you're sharing right now, and we ain't even got into it yet. Yeah. Is when people try to pretend as if that stuff was so long ago, and it just ain't. When we've got people that are still very much living yeah. and looking very much young. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to tell the stories of this. It's not that long ago. And Timber, it's not that long ago. You know, things go, you know, you know how would you say? Time, is, it travels so fast. But it's not long ago. And I remember, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to the part of where the lesson that your parents taught you, if you don't mind me jumping there. It was, I never forget, we were on a military base in Annapolis, Maryland. We were swimming the same swimming pools. You know, our parents belonged to the Naval Club, you know, the Women's Naval Club and so-and-so. I never forget my brother. He ran into the house one day, and he was like, Dad, Dad. He knew the word that he was being called was something bad, but he didn't understand it, but he knew it. So he came home, and he said, Dad, Dad, this boy called me this. Now, he was not familiar with the word. And it happens to be the word. Right. And my father said something to him. Whenever you hear someone call you that or anything out of what your name is, you do not acknowledge it or you do not recognize it. Bruh. That, I think that that was the lesson that I took with me. Is that you just, you just don't get caught up into it. You know, it's funny. As you share that, 
and and it's true, you know, because it's a bait. It's a bait. And um, but as you shared, I literally just saw a video probably a day or two ago with Dick Gregory saying the same thing. You're kidding. No. And he basically was kind of saying it along the lines of, you know, if someone calls you a cat and you know you ain't a cat, you getting mad about that? Or is you just ignoring that they called you a cat? And so, and I thought it was a really interesting approach or perspective to it. It's one that I hadn't heard it. You know, sometimes it's just how people phrase it or how the message is. Sometimes it's the messenger and the message. And in this case, it it hit me some kind of way. That was the lesson that I learned from my father and and from my mother, the same identical thing. No, you just you just don't you just don't acknowledge certain things. One day when I was training tenant council groups in Chicago, and <laughs> I, we were doing this workshop, and these people thought really that I was here for this management firm and for the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which they weren't. They were really getting used a lot. I was called every name. <laughs> I think that anyone could be called. Then my girlfriend was with me, and she said, Agnes, you just stood there, and you let those people call you all kind of names, and you didn't react. I said, but what happened later? She said, they got quiet, and we got down to business. Uh, Bruh. Okay. We got down to business. So, Agnes. Yes. How'd you get to Oshkosh? (laughs) Well, are you ready for this one? Yeah. I had retired from teaching in the Catholic schools, retired from working, you know, doing all, everything that I have done in Chicago, my God. And then I, I was retired, and my children had moved down to Florida, my older kids. They said, Mom, we're not there in Chicago anymore. You need to come either to us or you go where Andrew is. Now, my sons were at St. Lawrence Seminary which is about probably 23 miles from Fond du Lac. So they attended the seminary. Then every time I would go up there to visit them, it would be, oh, God, this is beautiful. Wisconsin is just so beautiful. So I decided that I would retire where Andrew was living, and he married a girl from here. Andrew attended Marion University, and then he attended Fond du Lac. At that time, it was UW Fond du Lac. So I ended up coming here. And uh, that's how I got to Oshkosh, retired here, supposed to be writing my own book while I'm here, all of my journeys. What do you mean supposed to? Ain't you doing it? Well, oh, you know what's so great? I have the deacon in my church, Deacon Rick. He is helping me now get the book together. And it's going to be an interesting book. It's going to be very interesting. You know, sometimes you never really realize your journeys until you really sit down and begin to write it. Mm. Yeah, you know, you never really know the things that you've done because you weren't looking really at those things. Right. Like, you know, okay, I did this. Oh, I didn't know I was going to do that. Oh, I got led into doing this. And sometimes God has a way of preparing you for it. And it's things that you never ever expected to get into. So, Agnes. Yes. How's your transition been to? My, you know what? As far as my life is concerned, I'm always on a journey. I'm always learning. And as my father says, you die learning. Mm, Facts. It's true. It is. You die learning. You don't know everything. I don't know everything. But I've, I've, I've taught myself through ups and downs how to laugh at things. I'm going to tell you for my black folks, we know how to laugh at things. <laughs> <laughs> Bruh. Ooh, ain't there some truth there? We know, and maybe it is because of the struggles of slavery, how we came here, and what we have achieved, how we were told we couldn't do this, We were less than this or that. Look at our achievements at what we did during the heavy-duty slavery. Mm. Look at that. Truth. Truth. 
look at that. Okay. Now, what I'm going to uh, I'm going to make some assumptions, Agnes, and that is this: there's a there's a lot of other there's more Agnes all in between Miami and Oshkosh, and yes, I think we're gonna get an opportunity to talk about in Florida, and, and you're gonna get a we're gonna get an opportunity to talk about more of that throughout the show. Yes, we will okay. definitely, definitely. Well, since you shared with us already that you are retired. I always ask the question, and I'm still going to ask the question. Okay. If you weren't doing what you do right now, and normally I say professionally, but in this case, we'll say retiredly. I just made up that word. What would you like to be doing? Okay. Right now. Okay. Let's not put what, what I would. Okay. 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 Let's do it this way. What I would have been with probably a civil rights attorney. Civil rights attorney, definitely. Oh, civil rights attorney. Yeah, because so many people were pulling me that way when I was in Florida and in Chicago. My association with many attorneys and this and that, Agnes, why don't you do the civil rights? I, I couldn't see myself doing that. I could see myself helping people, but another way, mm-hmm. not as an attorney. I'm too analytical and too <laughs> detailed. And sometimes too critical. Too critical sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. And then if not that, it was what my father wanted me to be, was a classical pianist. Oh. I yeah. love classical music. You were playing it when we were uh, talking the other day on the phone. I know. <laughs> so. Yes, I was. Okay. Well, you ready to jump into our first segment? Uh, yes. Okay. Our first segment is called What in the World is Going On With? And it's where you start with the phrase, what in the world? And then you you tell us what's on your mind. So what in the world is going on with affirmative action? Bruh. Ooh. Yes. Okay. Heavy subject. Hey, you, you, you swinging for the fences. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Now, okay, we had the Supreme Court that said out with affirmative action. Mm. Okay. Then just lately here in Wisconsin, was it a Republican? He said that they're going to limit affirmative action. So I, affirmative action has always not puzzled me, but coming from segregation and this and that, did we really need affirmative action? Was it needed in the 60s, 70s, 80s? to get kids into Harvard and the other schools that they said they would not, that they couldn't get into, did it hurt us or did it help us? Well, tell us. What is your opinion? My opinion is during that time, it was probably needed. I might get into trouble, but I don't think it's needed now. Hmm. And I may be wrong. It may be people who would say, she's wrong. It's needed now. I feel that we've gotten that that we've moved more forward. We don't have to force that anymore. I don't think we do. I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think we do. I don't think that happens. I think when people the affirmative action part of it I think the affirmative action that happens now isn't pushed by who they think it's pushed, which they think it's pushed by BIPOC people of color. Yes. And I don't think it is. I actually think it's pushed by the majority because they see the value of having, (laughs) because now it's, there's more, it's, it's business smart. There, there's a capitalistic advantage to it. No longer are you operating in a silo. If you own a business, you're almost international anyway. Yes. Right? So, I mean, I'm just being serious. Like, I'm not talking about mom and pop things. No. But even a mom and pop, if they're selling a product, they can put it online. You don't know who's buying your stuff. So, I mean, you need to have, it is to the advantage now to know people, all sorts of people. And to know people, you need to be near people. Okay, so would you say that the affirmative action now is being replaced by diversity, the DE? 
DEI. Yes. Would you uh, say that now? No, I don't think they're the same thing. You don't think they're the same thing? No, because DEI doesn't have the power that affirmative action had. DEI is more like, and this is me. I work yeah. it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I know. And so I'm not. I'm not going to say how everybody does it because what we're talking about is really broad stuff, right? And so, right. like, even when you say affirmative action, I don't think like there's places that they might need it. Let's be honest. There's yeah. still places where there's pretty strong feelings about some things, and they ain't letting nobody in if they, you know, if there's not things in place to assist that. Yeah. More of them that we more than we probably even want to admit to ourselves, right? Because we live more siloed. We live just as siloed as we might have lived before. <laughs> okay. But 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 what I'm thinking about is this is that mm -hmm. when you have this DEI, mm -hmm. many corporations are doing that now. Many corporations are making sure that they are what? Diverse. And that they're doing this and that. When we had affirmative action, but okay, go ahead. I was gonna say, but the purpose of DEI isn't necessarily to become diverse. Okay. It's to create a culture where you can retain mm -hmm. your talent that's diverse. Okay. And also, when you're saying, when you're doing DEI, there's a lot of things under that umbrella. Like the one thing we always talk about, and I don't like this personally, okay. is everything goes to black and white. Everything is culture and black and white. Yeah. But what falls under DEI is a lot of different things. Okay. Abilities. People that, how do you move? Can you, yep. do you walk with a cane? Do you have a wheelchair? Do you need this? Do you need that? Okay. That's DEI. Um, veterans. Yeah, the veterans are DEI, believe it or not, because they're yeah. a special demographic. People don't think about these things. If you are, if you need medical whatever yeah uh, uh, amenities or, or things done so you can work because of medical conditions guess what you are dei yeah. and so to if we could always get away with everything just being black and white because that's the most visceral part of to me of american culture and we go back to this whole thing that we all have difference in identity we all have different things that we do that make that give us our demographics and our identities, you know, whether it's faith groups, who are you, how you decide to worship, you know, um, once again, conditions, your mobility abilities, your medical health, how healthy are you, you know, and then swab in. And I mean, even other things like identities to careers, what but have you, you done career-wise? Okay, but you see, Timber, when people think of DEI, it's not explained like that. You understand my point? Yeah, but that that's people sometimes do explain it, but what we have is people with microphones who this makes for a really good enemy. Okay. If if you got the microphone and you get to say this is this yeah. and these people are horrible in our media, there's okay. always an audience for it. Yeah, but but again, okay, as I stated when it came to affirmative action, I meant really exactly what I said, and that has always been a question with me coming from segregation: is why do I have to force someone to accept me into their school? Why should I do that? Not if I've got this up here, you yeah. know. And when you come from segregation, that was the way I felt. You know, I wonder sometimes how do these kids, those students felt who were in these programs, quota, we got to do our quota. Mm -hmm. How did they feel attending these schools and they came through a quota? But that's something I can't not answer for them. That is something that they have to look at. Do I agree with affirmative action with the Supreme Court? Yes, I do. Do I agree that we do not need that now? I think that we that we don't need it now. And I probably will get some people saying, Agnes, la, la, la. You, you will probably get that argument of, no, yes, we still need it, and blah, blah, but... I don't know. No, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily disagree with you at all. Yeah. Actually, my thought process is this. I don't know if 
affirmative action, if people know what it is today, yes. and I think people define it by old terminology yes, or old understandings of things, yes. they think there's all this forced stuff yes. happening. And I just, you know, here's the thing. You've talked about a couple of different sections of things. I was that kid yes. that you're talking about who went to, was put in suburb schools where there was no diversity, but because there were tax payer funded schools there yeah. was a program called the 220 program in in milwaukee where i was an inner city kid that got bussed out to whitefish bay yes and went to school in whitefish bay and no it it was it was hard it was very hard now it's not hard because of some of the reasons that people think it is it was not the kids the kids were awesome yeah i had great friends yeah. Matter of fact, I was probably one of the coolest kids just because I had a tan. Mm -hmm. I hear you. The educators were supremely biased. And now, yes. Now, may I interrupt you for yeah. that? When I, in 1965, when I went to college, I went to a local college, government college, Miami Day Junior College. Would I ever forget that? I don't think so. We were, at that time, would you believe, our tuition was $75 a semester. Okay? We had the instructors that were from Alabama, Tennessee, the very prejudiced instructors. It wasn't the kids. We all could get along, but it was the instructors. Mm -hmm. And it was hard with the instructors. Mm -hmm. I remember in one of my classes, uh, you know, you weren't supposed to raise your hand to talk about you know, something that was brought up in the class. No, I did. I stood up and I talked. And that professor looked at me as if to say, what are you doing? Why are you talking? Why are you talking? There was no comment after that. The look was Sit down. When yes. We, yeah. We'll be the cheerleaders. They had a lady from Alabama, instructor. She was over the cheerleaders. Well, I had been a cheerleader in high school. The other black girl from Virginia, she had been a cheerleader in high school, too. And we both uh, went to try out. Boy, were we doing it. Lady came to us. I am so sorry you gals did not make the team. So we didn't get angry because it was that time and we knew what was happening. So eventually, my Day Junior College started bringing in black instructors and the school changed totally. So I understand that, the instructors. Now, to go full circle back. Yes. That is where, if there is any part of um, affirmative action, and I like to be honest, I don't think affirmative action means what people think it means nowadays. No one can force anyone to hire anybody based on matter of fact, it is illegal to hire anybody based on color of skin or anything like that. Can't do it. Can't do it. It's legal. What you can do is make intentional decisions to say we want to diversify our workforce because of who our constituents are that we serve. So to go back to where you started was your best experience was being in classrooms with black educators, right? And the black, okay, but what happened? We had to protest. It was a protest on campus. And it and it and it had to happen in order for them you were able to protest because you actually had the capacity to protest. But what do you do when you don't? Well, you accept it. No. No, you don't. <laughs> no, no. No, but, you don't. No, no, no. During, during our time, what we did, we accepted, and many of us just walked out of the school. We walked. We walked out of the school. The, the problem that we may have is if we walk out that school— yeah. They may close the door and lock it. No, but not there. Because there were some black students that did stay. 
But then there were the students like myself and others who said, I'm not staying in this school. Yes. I'm not staying here. Then years later, what do we hear? They've changed things. So, and I don't think it's a change. Did it happen immediately? No. No, Tim. It did not happen immediately. But it happened. Eventually, it happened. And it just does. It, it happens. It doesn't happen always immediately, but it happens. And see, I worry about some of these circumstances. Without the intentionality, it won't happen. And that is because people have choices. Yeah. So, and this will go into, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to jump into my what in the world is. And we'll tie this all together. Okay. So my what in the world is going on with is what in the world is going on with the superintendent situation in Green Bay. Now, I guess I don't know if you know anything about what's I happening don't right know now. Anything what's happening in Green Bay with superintendent? I knew some things that happened. Well, okay. Let me share a little bit. I want you to share it. All right. So right now in Green Bay, there is Green Bay has its first African American superintendent. Oh, and he's been superintendent since June, and he is on administrative leave right now. Now, that is because of, now here's the thing, what he had did, and I'm not going to get into the right or wrong of this stuff, okay. but we're just going to cover it. So I'm trying to give you background. Okay. He was trying to recruit teachers of color, particularly African-American teachers. So he was on a program, a radio show or a podcast in Atlanta, and he was recruiting out of HBCUs. Ah, so he's trying to recruit right now okay. during that program in a hot mics situation. So it wasn't something where he said this in the show or on the air on officially on the air, but he, he was critical of the makeup of green Bay and critical of some of the administrators or maybe an administrator. Okay. He referred to them as a witch, supposedly, and might have spelled out another word. Okay. And talked about how Lily White, so allegedly, and I'm putting allegedly because here's yeah. the thing. No one has the tapes. What? No, they don't have the tapes. The only reason this is a thing is because somebody, a former principal of Green Bay. Okay supposedly heard it on the show. Okay. And so they brought it back to the district and now are trying to get this superintendent disbanded. Now, part of the reason they brought back they they brought in this superintendent was to focus on the fact of the demographic shift that is happening in the Green Bay schools. Green Bay schools has if I am correct, and don't quote, quote me, okay. but I think they have like some of their middle schools or a middle school or two has as high as 70 to 80% students of color. Okay. But guess what they don't got? Okay. So, so I hear you. if you don't, that programming, if you, if you don't have things in place to help make those shifts, yeah, you know, education is to me, at times, it can be a gatekeeper situation. Yes, it can be. And so if you don't have some things in place, in place to pry the gate open, the gate might not open. Now, that also is this. And that I'm not going to say that people aren't welcoming to change the demographics of the, educa of the educators. Yeah, because here's the trickier thing. You've got to make it attractive enough for them to want to come. Because why do they want to come here? It is a highly, they're highly sought after nationally. Yes. And we're national now. People can move around. They, they are not, <laughs> right, people, people ain't stuck anywhere. If they want to move around and if you're in demand, that makes it even that much easier to move around. So then what are you, what are you offering? What are you creating culture-wise to make it inviting 
to bring in these people that you need because of the demographics of the school. All right. Okay. So right. to to kind of come full circle. Yes. In it and in, in, in the whole thing. So what I'm particularly sad about in this situation is, you know, from what I understand, and, and I haven't had a chance to meet the gentleman myself, but I had heard really good things about it and the things that he was implementing and the thoughtfulness that he was approaching this with and the, his understanding of the changes that had happened in in that particular school district and what he was going to try to do. I'm excited about it. What makes me sad is now this whole hoopla is going to side rail the whole thing. If if this is the situation, and we still have to say allegedly because there are no copies of this conversation out there or this interview out there. So then, you know, does he lose the vote of confidence of the, the district because of this, because of whoever supposedly was getting spoken about as somebody who had been in a district a long time and, da, 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 and this, that, and another, right? And so it just, it makes me sad. That's, that's the bottom line when, when it, when it all, when I shake out all of this and I don't want to elaborate really long on it, it makes me sad. Well, it is a sad situation because someone's going by the gossip or whatever that somebody else has told them and no one else has really heard the true facts. What did he really say? I think there is only, and don't quote me, quote me, but I think there's like literally one person, and this is somebody who was a former principal at Green Bay who was intentionally going in to go listen to the superintendent to hear what he had to say is the one saying this is what was said and da 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 da. Now, outside of that, it can't be found. Okay, so then people are going by gossip and by whatever else at, at this point in time until there is a recording that can be released but here's the thing and you know and god knows you know if you ever want to really find out the temperature or the culture of who you are all you got to do is go to the comment section yeah. of anything and so i was in the comment section of this article right okay. the paper and whoo the comments, I know. Yes, yeah. it was rough out there, and 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 not unapologetically, and 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 let's just say there was very strong racial overtones. Now, this dude, I don't care what y'all say, you know, this is somebody that earned the right. You don't just become a superintendent. Like this wasn't just some random hire. This wasn't people trying to call it an affirmative action hire, and it's like. That's not an affirmative action when you got a when you got a DR in front of your name and you've been working in education your whole life. life. Right. That's not an affirmative action hire. What that was is somebody who has a lens that you don't have. And you know when they typically give us jobs at that profile? Mm -hmm. When you get to be at the top of something like that, they give it to us when it done went to all heck. It's never when it's on the upward trajectory. No. They don't hand us the one that's like, oh, this is this is amazing. I'm retiring. I'm going to give you the amazing thing. No, they give it to you when they no longer, they don't want to fix it anymore. Let's just be honest. And, and it's a sad situation when I see it more complicated when a black comes into that situation there. And he says, okay, we need to make some changes. And we need to do this. Would it be, okay, suppose it was a white guy that came in there and did what he did and said, let's make the changes. What do you think would have happened then? I I don't know because I think that's tough. I think it's just as tough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. I do. I'm not saying it's any easier. And it's, and so because no matter how well-intentioned, Mm -hmm. Then I think people question, well, how do you know? How do you know those are the moves we should make? Or how do you know that's that's what we should do? And then the pressure might even be worse. 
Yes, and it and it would be worse if <laughs> if a white person, white individual, would go on there and say, "This is what we need to do in Green Bay, and we need to hire more of this and hire this and that." He would probably catch hell too. Oh yeah. Oh. Definitely. Period. period. Just period. Period. Yeah. But then again, you have to look at why is this still going on? Mm, facts. Why is this still going on? That is the best question. And I'm going to drop it at that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You ready to jump into the next segment? Yes, let's go. Our next segment is called 21 Questions. This is, we don't have 21 questions, but we might get 21 answers because these are really good in-depth questions. They are. All right. And I'm excited to hear what you got to say, Agnes. I'm excited to hear what Agnes got to say. <laughs> oh, <bruh. laughs> Oh boy, this is gonna be good. That that look, that might have been the most honest answer right there. All right. Oh boy. <laughs> Question one. What are you grateful for? Okay. I am grateful for life. To be living today, to being able to make a difference. And I'm very grateful for all the gifts that God has given me. And He's given me a lot of gifts. I'm grateful that I've had the chance to use these gifts when needed and to be able to continue to use these gifts that will help others. Whether they accept what I have said or what I'm doing, but the gifts that God has given me has helped me not to be so, okay, let's put it this way, to help me to be able to accept people for who and what they are. And that's a big thing for me. You know, people will say, this person did this, this person said, so well, listen, that's that person. They have choices. And whatever choice that they make, that's theirs. And they have to go through their own journey, their own thing, to be able to look at themselves. So I'm very grateful for the gifts that God has given me. And those gifts are like the, uh, how would you say it? The gifts of the Holy Spirit? I wouldn't say that per se, but <laughs> that's just me. Yeah, I know. it, But that's me. I'm the spiritual person, and, and my faith has made me that way. I refer to it as the universe. And then, yeah. Okay, and then, and then that is another part that I hear people say, the universe. What is the universe? Okay. For me? Yes. Oh. Well, you know what, Agnes? You're not going to get to interview me in the middle of 21 questions, because I'm going to bring you back. You can ask me this, well, this okay. later. We're going to ask you that later. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know what? I'm going to shut up right now, then let's go back. <laughs> you, wait. Go on. Wait. Hey, Agnes, you know that... Agnes, the key is people that heard me talk. I got, a many, I got a bunch of episodes. You know what they ain't heard? They ain't heard Agnes talk. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> what motivates you? Life. That's, that's my motivation. We have an interesting journey here. And, and it's really life which really motivates me. And the journeys that we can take in this life, it's, it's interesting. It's steady going on. I love it. What grounds you? My siblings. When things go so wrong sometime with me and I and I get on that airplane and I go to Florida and I'm with my siblings, they ground me. My children and my grandchildren. They ground me because that's my life. That's my my bloodline. My siblings things that they've done in their life, how successful that they have been, and they're still humble, very humble. I had a brother who will be celebrating 80 years old, mm. and he was one of the first black hospital administrators in the U.S., one of the, and he was in the Air Force, Air Force officer. I mean, I can go on about my siblings and how they're so humble. They have that 
they have that humility about them. So they ground me. They ground me a lot. What does success look like to you? Success to me is when God gives it to me. The universe gives it to me. I'm going to throw it back at you. <laughs> oh, I see how you work. You see how I work. No. Okay. And when it and when it comes from that, it's better that way. When I don't take it from someone, when when it's when it's given by God slash, you know, it's better that way because then you're more you're more successful. And things happen in a beautiful way, and you don't have to keep struggling to do the things. You know, it's like that little whisper always comes into your ear, you know. So that's what success means to me when it comes from, yeah, God. Mm-hmm. What irritates you? Oh, God. <laughs> okay. People who manipulate other people. Mm to get what they want. That irritates me, you know, to use people, use people's weaknesses to reach their own goals or to get what they want. That irritates me more than anything because I feel so sorry for the people that have been pulled into it and they've been used by the people who knows the games and how to do it. That really irritates me because then what it does is stops. How would you say this? It it really stops the the truth to be told and it even help the other people to grow and be able to look at themselves and why did I pull myself into certain things? That irritates me. I've seen the wrong that has been done with that. When I was in Chicago and everywhere else, I've seen it even here. So, you know, it's, it's, that irritates me more than anything, really. What scares you? Oh, wow. The media and its negativity. The media, how it uses, <sighs> how it uses its power, the media, how it, how it can use people's weaknesses and whatever to, that, that scares me because a lot of times people, some people don't think for themselves. You know, they believe everything, whatever the media tells them, you know. And that scares me because I came from the media when it was Walter Cronkite listening to him <laughs> and some of these other people, and they were, here's the facts. And it was no twists or turn things. So the media really scares me and what it has done to our society now. Well, no uh, alternative facts? Is that what she's saying? <laughs> well, my son, okay, my oldest son, he, he'll call me, Mom, you need to listen to this media channel or whatever. And he says, Mom, here you will get the, the truth. You will get the so-and-so, you know. So, sure, there's other alternatives. There's podcasts like you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're trying to say. Gotcha. I love it. I'm with you. Okay. You're right. <laughs> what recharges your soul? Prayer. That's it. Prayer. Bottom line. How do you define love? Okay. I define love as God slash selflessness. You're not selfish at all. You give it all. That's love. Last question. What is the most memorable life lesson you've learned from a parent, guardian, mentor? Well, I just told it just earlier about the incident in Annapolis, Maryland. And my father let us know. And my mother. When you hear certain words, you hear certain this and that, you just don't acknowledge it. And that's what I've been doing all of my life. I just don't. Even if I hear it from someone, Agnes, they so this and that. Okay, so what? You know, I've got to, I have to let it go. If I don't let it go, I can't move on. Mm, yes. You've got to let it go. 
there's such a thing as forgiveness, <clears throat> even if sometimes people do not deserve it. Mm-hmm. There's such a thing as give them love, even if they do not deserve it. But that's the only way how you get out of the, the bitterness and then it turns to peace. And then you say, hey, I got to move on. I got to smile. I got to jump on my bicycle. <laughs> I got to ride. I got to look at this future because I don't have it because it's not really, I can't control people's behavior. They have to have that self-control. I can't do it. Thank you. Okay. You ready to jump into the next segment? Whoa. Oh, yes. Okay. Next segment is called Word Association. This is where I'm going to say a word, and you're going to tell us what's on your mind. We always, we have a tradition here at the Kosh. We start with the same word every episode. It is the word of love. It is the word that bonds us all, that unifies us all across all identities. And that word is food. Food, food, food. Okay. First, when you say food, you think of health. Okay. You know, you know the great thing out is, oh, okay, you are what you eat. Okay. So we all know that. When I think of food, I think about my experiences in Chicago and in Florida, mostly Chicago. When I was working at Immaculate Heart of Mary Catholic School, I had a lot of parents there I met that was from different nationalities. And I was invited to almost every party that they had, those from India, the Philippines, Jewish people, name it all, Russians, name it all, I had a chance to eat some fantastic food and enjoy it. Now, the Russian people were in the building where I lived at, so they loved to salute. Salute was vodka. <laughs> with, <Bruh>. <laughs> <laughs> with raw fish, little crackers and all. So, not only in Macklin Hall Mary School, but also the building that I live in, which was a very international building. I just loved it. I just loved it. And I will go, first of all, the Philippines. Boy, can they roast a pig. And their parties were fantastic. And I had a lot of Filipino friends, so the food was just so fantastic. Okay, so we talk about food. The Russians, now let me get to them. Like I said, 100% vodka. And every time you would eat the fish, it would be salute. I said, Lord, by the time I get through a salute, I'll be on the floor mm, because I can't, <laughs> I can't drink this vodka. And then when it came to the Jewish people, what do you call it? It's a cedar or whatever. It's during one of their holidays. My sons and I were invited there to their celebration. Great food, super beautiful wine prayer and all. But the food again was great. Then I met the guy from Pakistan. Oh, I can go on and on and on about food and the different people. But from Pakistan, I met him. They were Muslims and uh, they had just bought, it was a Catholic uh, all-girls school. And they had just bought it and they turned it into a mosque and a school for themselves. And I met the gentleman, he was an attorney, while I'm doing all of my stuff in Chicago, so me and him, we hooked up. I was invited to their place for food. Oh, my God. Fantastic food from India. But they were really Pakistanians, which we all know through history what happened there and how they got divided, you know. So, but foods, I can go on and on, the Mexican foods, the foods from Ecuador. I can just go on and on about food. So when we talk about food, I can go on about foods. It'll be in my book. <laughs> It'll be in your book. It'll be in my book. Okay. Cocktail or beer? Okay. <laughs> I'm laughing about that. But when I was singing, it was a Bloody Mary because I needed to help me through the night. Mm. Okay. but. Really, I've come through with age. French red wines are my thing. French red wine. Yeah. Okay. That's my thing. That's the thing. Yeah. 
All right. Okay. I don't know if I would know what is a, a, a well, first of all, I'm I'm a horrible person when it comes to wine because okay. to me, wine is juice. So I, I don't even, <laughs> <laughs> I don't play with it. I don't get down with it. I don't need a glass for it. If I'm gonna <laughs> just, <laughs> but I like to drink really sweet wine if I'm going to bother to drink it. So it is juice. But, um, okay. Okay. But what's the difference between like a regular red wine and a French red wine? Well, the French makes beautiful wine. And I had to learn that during my journeys in life, drinking right. different wines and going to different wine parties and, and this and that. Then I learned, I mean, the Italian wines, the so-and-so wine, Australian wines, and wines from Spain mm. are very good, too. So it was like during, during my little journeys here, then I just come to the conclusion that what's great for me, what soothes me and calms me more, are the wines from France, French. Okay. I love it. The one thing I heard is everybody drinks wine. That's the truth. <laughs> That's the truth. Went, okay, but then they had some monks. Where is it? Where are the monks? The monks make some of the best wine in France. Oh, yeah. Let's see. <laughs> okay, I, I am now. Okay. Shop local. Now, are you ready for this? Mm. My son says to me, Mom, stop going to St. Vincent de Paul. Say, we know that you love to get your secondhand clothes. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with St. Vincent's. <laughs> it is not. I said, I just love St. Vincent de Paul. So anyway, I went to Ross with him the other day, and I enjoyed Ross. Okay. And of course, Walmart is always my other store. But I'm I'm crazy about St. Vincent de Paul. Really, I am. You know, some people may say, "What? No, not what." St. Vincent de Paul is pretty good there. Oh yeah, my joint is the Goodwill. That, that I buy a lot. Look, good. I buy majority of my shirts from the Goodwill. Okay. Because here's what you do: you find you there's. We've got really nice Goodwills in this region from from basically from Appleton down to Fondy, mm -hmm. right? And I just find either so many of these shirts are brand new, A, yeah. or you could tell they've been worn once or twice, and then I just send it to the dry cleaners. There you go. And then it's crisp again. Yeah. And that's the, that's it. And so, um, and I get great name brands. So shirts, yeah. I would never spend that money in a store. I can go to Goodwill, get that shirt, throw it to, put it in the um, dry cleaners, and boom, I got me a nice little polo. I got me a nice little this. I got me a nice little that. And uh, yeah, that's how I get down. Yeah, well, same with same Vincent DePaul. Also, you have to have the taste, and then oh, yeah. you you know you have to go through the rack. And I just take my time, and boy, I come out with all of this and that. And I said, okay. And it's not too bad because I don't have to worry about size because I'm so skinny. So it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> concert. Well, when it comes to concert, I'm going to talk about myself here. I did a concert at the International House at the University of Chicago. I've done several concerts, but to me, that was my best. And I had some musicians that were playing with me that were just the greatest that had played with some of the greatest themselves. So it was beautiful. I never rehearsed. People say, you're crazy, but I don't. I just get the musicians together, and I know exactly what I want to do. We talk about it. I have the ear, they have the ear, and we go up and then we perform. It's no thing. So that was what happened with this one at the International House. And it was a concert that I was really surprised about and, and the people that were there. So that's the concert I think more about than singing in the festivals and singing in other places and the clubs. That to me had more meaning than anything. Oh, uh, Agnes, you know you done open open the box because oh, you ain't on. you ain't talked to us about anything about you singing now. Well, we you know what that was that was something that I never planned. No, never planned it. Never. It was, I just, my late husband, who's, you know, he was a Vietnam vet, so I won't go into that one. But he was the one that uh, formed this pop rock band in Florida. And uh, he pulled me on board. <laughs> she was sure. I played piano and just sang background. And 
And then he changed the format of it to traditional mainstream jazz. And uh, before I know it, before I know it, I'm singing in festivals. I mean, after we divorced, before I know it, people from well-known people from Basie Band and everything else started just pulling on me and just saying, you know what you can do. You know, you were really a good, and I didn't never pursued it. I ended up with some of everything. Reviews and all on a demo. Reviews, a demo turned into a, an album. I'm like, what? So it was nothing that I had ever pursued. It, everything fell in place. That was just it. Hang on. What? Once again, you being, look, you, done, you keep opening these doors. So, Agnes, you play the piano. You do how many, do we play more than the piano? Do we play multiple instruments? Look, no, yeah, you you over here, you drip drip dripping this information. I'm gonna keep asking. No, the piano and and that was a gift that I didn't even know I had. But doing her travels in the navy and my mother, you want to hear this one? She was an ex jazz singer. Mm. So probably that was a gift. I don't know. Piano, and then my auntie Agnes, who I was named, you know, uh, she was from the Bahamas. She played piano, so you know, sometimes you have gifts and you don't even, you don't even pursue those, and then something happens that the gift is open. Facts, you know, and that's true. It just it just happened like that. Piano and all. Ask me my favorite music. You heard it, classical, classical. music. Next yeah. word. Okay. Streaming. Oh, my God. Now, that's a beautiful one. I have a Roku, which probably everybody has. But I stream public broadcasting station. My favorite show, Finding Your Roots. Mm. Oh, yes. I like that one, huh? That's a, that is a good show. That is a good show. I mean, to me, I recommend that show to anyone that has questions about their own roots, how they find out that, oh, wait a minute, this person back here, great, great, so-and-so did this or that and blah, blah. I just believe that show, everyone should look at it because also it goes through the part of slavery. A lot of black people, even though some of them end up crying on the show, and even people from other countries, they end up crying on the show. But that show to me, it's top notch. That's why it's been on the air for 10, 10 years. It's a learning experience. Mm -hmm. That show is a learning experience. Okay. <laughs> Last word. Diversity. Oh, I think we went through that. But diversity, let me tell you what I really enjoyed. Oshkosh Corporation created a panel because at that time they were addressing diversity at Oshkosh Corp. Dwayne Lasky asked me to be on, on that panel. And at that time they were just starting the DEI committee or whatever here in Oshkosh. That was one of the most, how would you say it? I've been on a lot of panels and workshops. That was one of the most, it was an eye-opener for me to see young people there at Oshkosh Corp who were so interested in that. They were really wanting to address the, the diversity there, and I had to give my hat off to Oshkosh Corporation for having that. It was really good, and, and, it, and it made me think about a lot of things, too, especially when they were asking me a lot of questions a person who came from segregation, one of the questions that really made me think about when the kids said, how did you guys do it? How did you guys do it? You go through that, that hard time. How did you guys do it when you had so many organizations and so many things going on with us? So many groups, so many different groups Facts. coming out that. A lot of different groups, you know, so. Okay. That is the end of that segment. Okay, next segment.
It's called The Kosh Hidden Gems. This is your opportunity to share a hidden gem with the Kosh listeners. And that hidden gem can be anything. It could be something everybody knows about, but maybe they don't know some specifics of it. Or maybe it's something you don't think anyone knows about and we need to learn about. Oh, wow. Hidden gems. Okay, this is Black this is Black History Month. It right? is Black History Month. Okay. What I like about the movies that they have coming out now, you know, we did have in the 70s the Black exploitation films, which were violent and the this and the that and so so. I personally like the Kung Fu in them. <laughs> <laughs> if it was one that had some Kung Fu in it, I was all about it. Uh, you know, and that was so-and-so. But I like what we're doing now which I will call hidden gems <clears throat> because a lot of people will probably say, I'm not going to see that movie. Uh, my hidden gem right now is about the three black ladies. Mm-hmm. And the movie's called Hidden Faces. Am I correct on that? Or Hidden... Um, what, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm it's, not... It's, it's, it's Hidden... Oh, uh, I, I know this too. Uh, it's, <clears throat> it's not Hidden... F- Hidden. It's hidden. So, uh, well, you know what? Okay. We're just we'll going to figure put, it out. We'll put it in the podcast notes. Right. It's going to come to me. Okay. And it was hidden, whatever. And these three women in this movie, you'd have never thought that they had hidden figures. Hidden figures. Now you got it. That's it. Hidden figures. I, I lived in that era at that time. I did not know that there were black people really working NASA. They had to go through the back doors, use the the black bathrooms, and the influence that they had in that program, in that space program, and what they did, people don't know. So I will say, look at that movie Hidden Figures. You will find out what these black women and their influence was on the computers there. Okay, everything that they did, what happened in that movie, you would say, what? Because it was never told. No. Hidden figures. Hidden oh, figures. no. No, no, no. No, it was never told. And I believe the lady who also influenced the, but she had the formula or whatever it was that was needed to help. Well, she, she, she did the work. She did the work. She, she did, did the work. The, by hand. By hand. She did the work by <laughs> did the work hand. By hand. And then when they had her to go to, to go and to teach the all the white scientists, some of them resented her. But she was standing up there on that blackboard and said, duh, 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 duh. she knew. Then the other black woman who went in there when they had problems trying to get the computers together, mm-hmm. and she had her computer group, she walked in there and she <laughs> straightened showed it out. out. Straightened it out. And she straightened that computers out. Computers started working. And it's not just the hidden figures. There are many more movies that are coming out that are history. And not just the Walk Across the Bridge movie. There are so many movies that are coming out about the influence of black people have made. Well, the impact that blacks have had on this society in America. They're coming out now. I will advise people, since it is Black History Month, to go to your libraries or just put on their black history. You've got computers today. You have a lot of things today. And even our own black people need to know. Oh, no, because we don't know. Definitely, because we do not know because it's been. Well, it wasn't. It was not put into those books. No, and it was not put into those books. So that's why when you hear, I can't think of his name, but when he says the problem is is that we need courses in black history in our schools. Which is American history. Which is American history. That was never really put in those books. Okay, we put slavery in there. Okay, and this and that. Okay, but that was even to a certain point. We really need to, as you state, put the black, put the true black history in there. Put it in there. Put it in the books. And I think that 
a lot of black kids will feel also different about themselves. What I would like is for them to just put it in the book and not separate it and just uh, put it in the book. book. I get you. Right? Because once again, it's American history. history. Let's not be selective in what qualifies for American history because I don't want I it, this is where I will agree with you. Okay. Full circle on I don't want us to have uh what was, what was the term we were using earlier? Uh, uh, affirmative affirmative action. Affirmative action. I don't want affirmative action history. Thank you. I just want complete history. History. And 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 you were right about that, Timber. And then I I totally agree with that. You know, once we sit down here and we talk and we talk about the DEI, we talk about the affirmative action. You know, you can sit down and then you can see the difference what you were talking about. But as we say, black people in America, and I don't mean people from you know people from the islands. They had their own experience. They've come here because of what, whatever. Okay. But those that came with those chains around them and this and that, they are a part of this. They are America. They are America. They, they, they are America. I, I tell people all the time they're the most American because that's all they know. And it's true. There's not a history to trace back to. So no. this is the beginning. And and then I like when, uh, what's this, Smokey Robinson, he said, I don't like being called African-American. He said he doesn't like it. So the, uh, the interviewer, oh God, I can't think of the interviewer name. He said, why not? He said, because truly we are not. We created our own culture. We created a black culture. We combined European with everything else. And we created a beautiful, beautiful black culture. And Smokey is right. I think that on applications, they said, do you want to be called black American or African American? Well, the Africans that are coming over here now, they're African Americans. Who's been coming over here for the past, God knows how many years. They're African Americans. They know their culture. Uh-huh. And facts. And they, facts. They know their culture. culture. They know their village. They know their so-and-so. They can say, I'm going to whatever, because I live with a lot of Africans also in that building. They know their culture, and they know it well. Uh-huh. They dress the dress. They well, do they, this and that. Well, they know the no. <clears throat> okay. So I see them as African Americans. Facts. And they are, they truly are. And sometimes I just envy, I said, boy, I said, isn't this so great how they can go back and and they truly know everything? Well, they move different. Yeah. They carry themselves different. Yes. They don't, they do not move around here with that baggage. No, and you're right. They They carry themselves with identity, with strength, with pride, like... Mm. If you don't know, <laughs> yeah, know be be around be around some African people. Oh, I know, like because, uh, for and, real, for real. Yeah, because I was in this building too that had all these different nationalities. There, the Russians and all, and that's one thing about the Africans. They know, they know, and they have a certain pride about them. They have a certain thing about them. Well, they can because they know. They know. They know. Facts. Woo. Bruh. Okay. That hit hard. <laughs> okay. Well, you know what we're going to do right now? We are going to take a short commercial break. All right. Did you know there are children in the Fox Valley in need of hearing aids, but their parents struggle to provide them because of lack of insurance or high copays? I am Juliette Sturkins, audiologist and board member of Here in the Fox Cities, and proud that this small local nonprofit organization has helped fund hearing aids for some 30 kids. Your donation would help more children hear. 
Visit hereinthefoxcities.org to learn more and to see their smiles. Every child deserves to hear. All right. So it is time for my favorite segment in the show. And y'all know, uh, it used to... There's things that I really, really enjoy, but my favorite, favorite time in the in the cash is actually story time. And so story time is an opportunity for our guests to share a story with us. That story can be about absolutely anything. And you know what? I know Agnes got <laughs> stories for us. <laughs> oh my God. Wait. Agnes, you know now. So, like, wait, wait. I'm excited because I think you're gonna take us places. So, where, we, where Agnes, what you got to share? Okay, you know, as a, I was, I think I was about in ninth grade, and when we were living in Cocoa, Florida, and then they had the Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh wow, that was scary, and we lived on. I-95, which takes you straight into Key West. And we know where, when you get to the end of Key West, there's Cuba, Cuba, right across there. Think about 90 miles from us. And at that time, it was the Russians and Cuban leader Castro and the U.S. And it was Kennedy was the president at that time. So the news wasn't like what it is now, you know, no big, huge YouTube and all the rest of that. So we stood outside our home, which was right up on a hill, right down from I-95, and to see the tanks driving by your house, Mm. tanks, Mm -hmm. all of this going by you like a war. We are getting ready for a war now. And you stand there as a kid and you see this happening. It's a frightening situation. Because you don't know what's going to happen next. So when you, it was like, are we heading to war? We're in Florida. We'll be the first hit. You know, all of this is going to be happening. That was the most frightening time in my life was when I saw those tanks going to I-95. That was frightening. To see the Army trucks. The whole military, I said the whole military to me seemed like it was the whole military. And it wasn't. But to be heading down to Key West, where Boca Chica Base is, and I was born on Boca Chica Base, it was frightening. And it's a story and it's something that still stays with me. When I look on TV and I see these kids that are in these wars in Ukraine and these other areas, they are, they're seeing worse than what I did. Hmm. And I, that stays with me. That stays with me when I think about war. Yeah. Facts. Okay. Yeah. That, man. <laughs> Bruh. I felt that. Yeah. I felt and, that. And you keep it with you. Okay. Well, thank you for that story. And now we're going to move on to the next segment. Yes. All right. It's time for the topic of the week. Topic of the week is chosen by our guest 99.9% of the time. And this week is no different. I'm super excited about this week's topic of the week. Agnes, what is our topic of the week? The topic of the week is Oshkosh Civility Project. Mm, Let's go. And the reason why, you know, I, out of all the organizations here in this city, I just gravitated to them. Because they were addressing being civil, which is something that that we have a deep problem with. (laughs) And I mean a deep 
problem with. Some people will say, oh, I'm civil and I got these principles and, you know, and uh, this book and blah, blah. I loved it when I was given the opportunity, which every member of the Civility Project has the opportunity to write an article that would be published in the Northwestern. So it really gave me a chance to express myself and how I feel from my journey and all of my experiences in life. I was able to write just the way that I felt. So I'm just going to briefly, just recently I wrote an article about selfishness on the rise in our society. Let's go. And and it is on the rise in our society. And it has been on the rise for a long, long time. I don't, I don't know if it's a rise as much as it is just part of the fabric of the culture. Yes. And... And it is part of the culture, and it has become a part, a part of our culture. And it has because we have allowed it to. We as a people, we don't, we don't speak up the way that we should. Even if we see a friend of ours doing something and we think it's very selfish and, you know, they're trying to reach their own goals by doing this and knocking people down and all of this, A lot of times we do not say anything and say, hey, you are wrong. You know, your organization is wrong or this is not the right way that you do things. So when I wrote the article, okay, all of their articles are based on P.M. Forney's book called Choosing Civility. I will recommend that book to anyone. I got blessed with a copy of that book. Yes. From uh, Scotty. Yes. And uh, it's a fantastic book. Now, me being an ex-librarian, too, as you said, Agnes, you haven't told us a lot, but I'm an avid reader. I could, oh, God, oh, God. I love to read. I love to write reports. I love all of that. So this last one that I wrote is, to me, it's more, as you say, becoming part of our fabric. And it is. It's a shame, but it is. So I think in the end, I think I wrote that, what are we doing to achieve our goals? I said, I believe manipulation with the assistance of the media is at the heart of some of our achievements. And why some? Because not all people use negative tactics are all our people self-centered. But we have allowed this to come into our culture, and it's here. Will it stay? I don't know. But we do read about it in the news and we hear about it from friends and family. And in some cases, we personally experience it, the selfishness that people do to get what they want. Everyone is like, hey, I want my goal. I'm going to reach this. But do you have to reach it a certain way? Can you do it another way? Yes, there's always another way. But that's not... You know, I, I I feel you on this. I have feelings about this, big time. And so we have to look at that, I think. And, and, and I would recommend for people to really get a, the, the, the Northwestern and really read some of the articles that the Civility Project has written, people that are members of the Civility Project. I think also another one that I did, so I'm going to do this quickly. <laughs> no, no, just come on. Okay. Let's go. Okay. Another one that I wrote, which I think we brought up. You know, a lot of times when people are agreeable, sometimes they're agreeable because they do not want to stop the progress. Are you saying, I don't want a lot of conflict? Mm-hmm. Or maybe if I agree to this or that, that maybe this will stop it. But sometimes being agreeable can make you look weak. People think then, oh, you're weak. I would be able to go with this person or go with this organization because they're weak, and it's not true. It's not true. I have found out by myself that because I love to be agreeable sometimes and just say, okay, let's just stop the conflict, let's just work, work together, that people can find you to be a weak person. And 
and it's not true. Sometimes you're just biding your time. Correct. You're biding your time for the truth to come. You're biding your time and saying that this can happen. I think sometimes you're biding your time to get on the inside because it is very difficult to make change from the outside. It's true. And it's true. And in a way, too, Timbers, that some some people, they, if they feel that you're weak with this or that, they take advantage of it. Then they take things and they twist stories around to where it almost looks like it's the truth. Mm. And that's what they do. But then the person who they think is weak is not weak. The person who they think is weak just says, hey, just forget it. You go ahead on. You do what you're doing. I'm biding my time. And hopefully people will be able to see the truth or see what you're doing. It's no more. And you have to end it that way. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hopefully. Wait, no, no. I'm just, I'm just using, you said hopefully. So I'm just bringing the hopefully back around. Yeah. Okay, then. Okay, then. So you're right. Hopefully. Does it happen? Depends on the person or the people. Mm-hmm. If they want to face the truth about themselves, about whatever, then it can happen. My father said something to me a long time ago and my mother. Once you tell a lie, you've got to continue to tell lies to support other lies. And it keeps going on and on and on. Who can stop the lies? Is the, how would you say, you know, like you, you're pushing a product. All of a sudden, people find out the product is not true. Mm. Then the people that are pushing the product has to finally tell the truth. Then it's taken off the market. <laughs> it's taken off the market. Right. Because people see, okay, we've been told lies. And, and it can go for any segment or any part of life. I cannot see myself because of the way that I was raised and doing something to really harm others unknowingly. Some people do it unknowingly and others do it knowingly. I can't see myself doing something knowingly. And if I do something unknowingly, I'm the first one to say, wait a minute, Agnes. Wait one minute. You got to get this straight. Is there any last things that you want to say about your topic? The last thing I want to say about my topic is that the Civility Project is the best thing as far as I'm concerned that is here in this city that really addresses the issue of change people changing their thoughts, the way that they think. And also when it comes to the black and white issue, any issue at all, if we can be civil to people, most of all, look at ourselves and change ourselves. It would be a better world. Facts. I just want to make sure that we do acknowledge that. uh, Send a big shout to Alex, Scotty, you know, we do have a uh, episode on the Civility Project. So uh, go out there and check that out on the Kosh here. We, we've had this conversation on one side of it. And uh, actually, they were the individuals that said, oh, no, you got to have Agnes. <laughs> and guess what? <laughs> now we don't have Agnes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, that's how the cash works, you know. We, you know, we we listen to the listeners. We listen to those in our community, and uh, you needed to be heard. And I'm so glad you spent time with us today. So, we're gonna start wrapping up this episode. <coughs> All right, cash listeners. I just want to take a moment, and I want to say thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for spending time with us. Thank you for giving us your minds and your ears. 
Thank you for being a caring community member who wants to hear about the experiences of another neighbor of ours, in this case, Agnes, and her experiences here in our region, her experiences in life as a whole. Um, This is how we become a better community. You become a better community when you know your neighbors, and that's what we do here at the Kosh. We get to know our neighbors. Um, You know we are a work in progress. We are trying to become the best podcast in Wisconsin that we can possibly be, definitely the best one in the Fox Valley, if if so, you know, if universe willing. (laughs) You like that one? Okay, I like that one. (laughs) Uh, All right. And so how do we do that? That's with your help. So... Please, please, please feel free to reach out to us and tell us how we're doing. Tell us how we can improve. Tell us what we can do better. Tell us what you like and what you don't like. Also, if you'd like to be a guest on the Kosh or if you'd like to recommend a guest on the Kosh, you can reach us at askthekosh at gmail.com. Once again, that is ask the kosh at gmail.com all right and kosh listeners there's one more thing that i need your help with in this and that is this help us improve our analytics we're trying to get in front of everyone and how do we do that by you guys hitting the subscribe button so hit the subscribe button while you're listening right now and then the other thing that i need you to do is leave us a review those two things will help raise our analytics and better analytics is what gets us in front of more listeners in front of more ears okay so at this time it is that part of the show it is shout out time okay agnes what you who you shouting out this week i am shouting out birch art studio Mm. they just opened their doors i think about three or four months ago and they have fantastic instructors in every type of art form that you really want to be in. Uh, the owner, I think her name is D. Olick, and a friend of mine is working side by side with her. D has been in the business for over 30 years, teaching art, science, and whatever else. And Aaron has been in the business with art for a long time. So I've been in this art scene here in Chicago. And Chicago, why is it Chicago? Okay, Agnes, Oshkosh. <clears throat> and uh, I've seen what is happening. So I really believe that Birch Art Studio would be the place to go. Please call. You can get some very good instructions with all types of art and everything else. and the teaching of the different art forms that they have. Great instructors. I think it will bring you back for more. And also, I believe that you'll be ready to reach out to even do more art. And they're right there on Oregon. And it's a beautiful little place. And it's very nice. And go to Art, the Birch Art Studio. Look them up. That's, to me, the shout out. Okay. All right, let me um, let me go through my shout outs real quick here. So okay. I want to send a spot, shout out to every professional. Uh, we had our first third Thursday's Black Professionals Networking event in Appleton. I, I got to partner with People of Progression and Jesus Smith from a professor at Lawrence. And they showed up. The professional showed up. It was fantastic. It was a vibe. And I can't tell you how many people, it was people who'd been here for 20 plus years to people who had been here for two months and they were happy. And just to be in that energy was amazing. It was smooth. And and I want to give a very special shout out to the Commodore Club because they allowed us to host this event there for free. There was love in that space. And so I, I, I just want to make sure I give that shout out to that. I can't I can't express enough how that filled hearts and filled souls. And it's something we need more of. So third Thursdays, keep your eyes out for that if you are a black professional. I want to send a special shout out to the Oshkosh School District for hosting the your um for the Read Your Heart Out event. I got to participate in that. I got to read books. I I read um over five 
I read the same book five times, but it was five sections of kids coming in. And uh, I want to share a little story about that. And this is what, this is why this is special. And I can't express to you enough why representation is so important sometimes. Um, You know, I was, I had, I picked a book. I was in a room and these, these were students from kindergarten through fifth grade, I believe it was. And this class was probably like a second, grade class, I believe it was. And I'm sitting at a table and I got a projector so I can put the book under the projector and it shows on the screen. When these kids walked in, there was these three black boys, these three black boys. And the minute they walked in the class, like I could feel them and they wouldn't take their eyes off of me. And they come in the class and the class sits down in the front of the class on a carpet And I'm off to the side at the table with the projector, right? And while I'm reading this book, because that's what you do for the read out loud, you're reading a book to the students. These, These boys were just in my energy. They were in my energy and I was in their energy. So then you get 20 minutes and the bell rings and they get up and they line up like second graders would. And there's this one young man, and I was vibing with him the whole time. I could feel him. He never really took his eyes off me. And he's, they're marching out of the room, and before they marched out, he jumped out of line, and he ran at me, and he hugged me, buried his head in my legs. Yeah. And I felt that. Yeah. And that he didn't have to say nothing to me. He said everything. Yes. And I said everything to him back. And I can't express the power of that, that experience. I will never forget it. Yeah. So I just want to say thank you, Oshkosh School District, for A, hosting that, for making that possible, and being thoughtful enough for these students to give these types of opportunities. It was powerful. Last shout out goes to Lakeisha Hayes. Yeah. It is time to uh, vote and get out there, get out there and get your vote in. You know, I'm going to personally be uh, casting mine for Lakeisha Hayes. So I want to say a hey, thank you for running again. We appreciate you and wish you the best in this election. Absolutely. Okay. Last thing, Agnes. Yes. And you've got three choices. Yeah. Okay. You have the opportunity to, A, bless the Kosh listeners with some parting words of wisdom. B, tell us what would yourself today tell your 13-year-old self? Or option C, you can do both. I'll do A and B. Is that okay? Well, that's option C. <laughs> Yeah. That's right. Okay, that's- All right. Okay, let, okay, okay. You get to do it. Absolutely. Okay. Let's go. I will tell my 13 year old self that has been through segregation and all, Agnes, it can't happen. And it did happen. Facts. Yeah. Yeah. I will. And, and it will continue to happen. For my grandchildren. More facts. Yeah. Now, the words of wisdom is from an article that I did with, that I ended. I did with a civility project, and it was about the dangers of gossip and social media. At the end of it, I'd said this. Remember that words have the power to heal or hurt. Recognize when you have fallen into negative gossip. Examine it. Look past your own interests and status. Throw the gossip aside and openly communicate. I got to like that one, Agnes. All right, it is time. <laughs> Agnes, thank you for spending time with us. Yeah. I appreciated this. Yeah. 
the cash. Thank you.